Greetings. My name is Morley Robbins, and I'm very excited to share some time with you, with the folks who are very curious. Uh, you got to spell it right. See you hyphen, right? So we see the symbol for copper. Uh, I wanted to share a, a Google search that I did this morning based on a, a recent conversation, and it, it led me into a completely different area of research. Some of it was familiar, but I came at it with fresh eyes. And I was inspired to look up stillborn, stillborn birth, stillborn, and I used the other word was the iron enzyme called zyklopen, Z-Y-K-L-O-P-E-N. You all have heard me talk about ceruloplasmin. You may have heard me talk about hafestin. Well, there's a third they're called multi-copper oxidases, which means they're really important. They're why we're here on the planet. Uh, they can turn oxygen into water. They're very, very special enzymes. But zyclopen works in the placenta during pregnancy. And I just wanted to see what, what would happen if we pitted those two words, stillborn and zyclopen, and see if there's some dimension of iron metabolism involved in a stillborn birth. And... I was surprised with the, the information that came back. But in particular, in this article that I was um, referenced to, had a very important reference to an article that I've read easily four or five times before. Uh, it's by a world-renowned hematologist named Nancy Andrews. And she, uh, she retired, I want to say 2016, might have been 2018, but she was the first... Uh, woman dean of Duke Medical School. She was the first woman to be heading up uh, a prestigious medical school in the country. And this is the cover of her article, New England Journal of Medicine, 1999, um, and it's on the disorders of iron metabolism. Now, you've heard me talk about copper and iron a lot, uh, but, but what this article is really introducing us to is some of the disorders that take place uh, in the movement and the trafficking and the recycling of iron throughout the body. Now, I said, again, I've, I've read this article at least four, maybe five times, but I read it with fresh eyes this morning. And I was drawn to uh, a paragraph. Again, I've read it before, but, I, but it popped out at me. Now, let me just share it with you right now because I think it introduces where the confusion is about iron deficiency anemia, which is considered the number one nutrient deficiency on planet Earth, versus what I think is the, the true anemia, which is called anemia of chronic inflammation, or I think more accurately should be called anemia of copper deficiency. And the, the tragedy or the challenge is that the symptoms of both iron deficiency and copper deficiency present the same way in the blood. Mind-blowing to think about, but it's true. So here's the, here's the series of sentences that really caught my attention. In a typical non-pregnant adult, less than two milligrams of absorbed iron per day, less than two milligrams of absorbed iron per day is needed to maintain iron balance. Very important phrase, iron balance. At least 10 times this amount of iron, 20 to 25 milligrams, is released into circulation daily from the, from the breakdown of dying red blood cells. And then she references a very important article that I've never read before. It was fascinating to come across it. And it was from 1973. So she's writing the article in 1999. But and she's referencing a very important article from 1973 called Iron Kinetics with Emphasis on Iron Overload. A very different thought process, iron deficiency versus iron overload, written by Dr. Cook. And the, the, uh, the real lead author is Dr. Finch. And uh, they were at the University of Washington in St. Louis. So very prestigious crowd of, of hematologists writing uh, both of these articles. But let me go on with the, the uh, information from Dr. 
Andrew's article, iron that enters the circulation is used predominantly by bone marrow erythroblasts, that's just baby red blood cells, to support the demand for making red blood cells. Okay, that's, that's easy. But here's the kicker. Absorbed iron that exceeds daily iron requirements is stored primarily in the liver and the spleen. But when excess stores are present, iron can also accumulate in the pancreas, ding, 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 think diabetes, in the heart, ding, 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 think cardiovascular disease, and endocrine organs, ding, 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 think thyroid issues. Uh, and so what she's introducing the reader to are some numbers that you're not familiar with. We only, she says we only need two milligrams of iron a day, that the bulk of the iron we need daily to, re, to replace the red blood cells that are dying, and there's two and a half million red blood cells dying every second. They've got to be replaced. And over the course of uh, 24 hours, is 200 billion red blood cells. It's a big number, a lot of, lot of uh, red blood cells that need to be replaced. And what she's introducing the, the reader to is the truth of iron recycling that apparently is not well known in practitioner circles because we're led to believe that iron deficiency anemia is the number one nutrient deficiency on the planet. World Health Organization has multiple citations, 2011, 2012, 2018. I, I haven't seen one in the in the, uh, the 2020 or plus uh, time frame, but I'm sure it's it's just a matter of time. But but what this new information intrigued me to do is is come up with the proposed genealogy of how anemia, iron deficiency anemia, was born the genealogy of how anemia was born. And so let's go back to the very beginning. In 1928, there were two very important studies done, March of 1928 at the University of Wisconsin by Dr. Hart et al. Uh, and, 19, and that was March of 1928, May of 1928, we're at the University of Kentucky with Dr. McHarg and his colleagues. And in both studies, they were withholding copper from the animal's diet, the animals happen to be uh, rodents, uh, mice and, and rats. And what did they learn? They learned that when you withhold copper in the animal's diet, iron accumulates in the liver first and foremost. That was a century ago, folks. They knew that a long time ago, you pull copper out and you're going to have an iron accumulation problem that's going to trigger untold dysfunction and dysregulation in the body. A few years after that, 1937, we have <clears throat> three physicians, two from Harvard, one from Hopkins, receiving a Nobel Prize for their preeminent work using the same product to cure anemia and B12 pernicious anemia with the same product. What was the product? <sighs> Beef liver. Imagine that, getting a Nobel Prize for using beef liver. And that, that's a big deal. And so what most people don't know is that there's actually three times more copper in beef liver than there is iron. We've been led to believe that it's an iron organ, when in fact it's a copper and retinol organ especially. And, and there are all sorts of reasons why. And we'll talk about that in subsequent uh, video conversations. But 1937, we're, getting, we're given Nobel Prizes for beef liver to cure anemia, to cure pernicious B12 anemia. We roll forward, 1941, through some legislative fiat, the UK, Canada, and the United States all decide under the, the threat of war that they're going to start to fortify the food with iron. 1941. And it's not just, it's not organic iron. It's not heme iron. It's the most obnoxious, toxic form of iron, <clears throat> iron filings. Now, the reason why this is significant is that in 1938, McCants and Whittison 
preeminent British scientists, McCants was a pediatrician, Woodison was a biologist, they were the definitive team to study nutrients in the diet prior to the war, through the war, and their study, I believe, is on its 18th edition now here in, in 2025. That is the go-to source for what's happening through uh, for food uh, in our diet. In that particular study in 1938, they identified that all we needed was one milligram of iron to go through our mouth to support the amount of iron that was needed because the other 20 to 25 milligrams was coming from our recycling system, which is exactly what Dr. Andrews is telling us. This is, this is not Sally Smith down the street. This is Nancy Andrews, who is a preeminent, highly respected uh, hematologist, gets her, medical degree, gets her medical degree from Harvard, and she gets her doctorate in biology from MIT. So she's, she's no lightweight, and when she's like E.F. Hutton, and she speaks, people listen. And so she's telling us we only need, she says we need two milligrams, but back in, in 1938, it was one milligram. But she's acknowledging the fact that we've got this very sophisticated recycling system that is supplying the body with 20 to 25 milligrams of iron to replace the bazillions of red blood cells that need to be turned over every 24 hours. So 41, they started adding iron filings. Uh, and, and I've actually found the, the um, Federal Register has the, um, the regulation from the Food and Nutrition Board in 1940 that mandated this addition of iron. So, so right in the same time frame. Well, then in 1946, there's a very important letter that was written by a very important hematologist named Max Weintraub and one of his colleagues, uh, Dr. Greenberg. And they were at the University of Utah. Um, Dr. Weintraub was invited to head up the, the School of Medicine. Uh, he had been at Hopkins previously. He wrote the first textbook in hematology in 1941, single-handedly. Today, his textbook takes a team of 8 to 12 hematologists to keep up with all the research that's taking place. But the important thing in this article from 1946 is they document that there is this recycling pool of iron that's made possible through this very sophisticated reticuloendothelial system and within the RCP, we just call it the recycling system. But in 1946, they acknowledged this one milligram and the need for 24.4 milligrams coming from the recycling system. So we're getting a, a theme of validation of, of the research. And so then we fast forward from 1946 to 1972. Uh, we're dealing with the research coming out of the British Medical Journal. And what they're introducing us to, Jacobs et al., very, very uh, highly regarded team of uh, hematologists in Wales, and they introduce us to the ferritin protein. Serum ferritin is the way to measure blood, measure iron status in the blood. And everyone's now shifted their focus, and everyone's worried about ferritin, not knowing that ferritin has no relevance in a body with inflammation. And there's a whole line of scientists that have documented and proved that measuring ferritin is completely irrelevant. And that's really why I renamed ferritin eritin. It, it's just not, a, it's, I don't think it's a valid marker for iron status. Hemoglobin makes so much more sense because that's where 70% of the iron is found in the body. And so we've got to be really careful about what, what markers are we using to, to assess whether someone has enough or too little or too much iron. So that's 1973. Then in 1970, that's 1972, 1973, um, Dr. Jacobs, as I noted earlier, refers to this research by Cook and Finch about iron kinetics with emphasis on iron overload. And they're just, they're reinforcing this whole dynamic about stored iron versus the recycled iron. And then we come full circle to 1999, and we're back to, to Dr. Andrews. The reason why I bring all this up is there's a tremendous 
fear in society that people are anemic. And we see it daily within the root cause protocol. And what I want to challenge you with is the research does not support the narrative. This concept of this meme that, that you're anemic and you're copper toxic, which pretty much runs medicine. That's the, that's the real cornerstone of medicine is it's invalid. It is not supported by the research. And what excited me this morning was I was, again, I've read the article before, but I never really captured what Dr. Andrews was saying about the limited amount of iron we need in our diet versus the significant tenfold greater need for the recycled iron. And what drives that recycled iron? It's copper. That whole process of recycling iron is copper dependent because the iron can't get out of the recycling macrophages. And those are the Pac-Men that gobble up the dying red blood cells. And they have a little doorway in the back called ferroportin, iron doorway. And that ferroportin requires bioavailable copper expressed through either hephaestin or through ceruloplasma to open up and allow the iron out so it can get back to the bone marrow so that the new red blood cells can be made every second, two and a half million, every second. I, don't, I think that's a really important number for people to know about. And so this idea that we are iron deficient is not supported in the research. And the, the challenge that I had from the, from the get-go is, so iron's the number one planet on the, iron's the number one element on the planet. Number one element. 36% of the Earth's composition is iron, and humans are anemic. Well, what that means is the most evolved species can't metabolize the number one element on the planet. Well, that doesn't pass the sniff test. So that's why I was drawn to find out what, what's the real story. And that's when the whole copper metabolism dropped into my lap, and, and my life has never been the same. So... Um, Delighted to spend this time with you. Appreciate you taking the time to, to hear me out. Uh, make sure that the articles I'm talking about are in the in the show notes. And we'll have a, a transcript of this available for those who want to share it with their doctor. And I, I think the most important thing to, to realize is that um, a, another article that I'm going to talk about in, in a subsequent uh, video is the difference between making new red blood cells when there's a steady state, everything's calm, nothing's going on, versus when you're under stress. Do you know anybody who's under stress, right? Like we all are, right? We're waiting for the next shoe to drop. And so the whole dynamics of red blood cell production, red blood cell maturation is completely different under stress than it is under steady state. And so we'll talk about that in the next video. So thank you all for taking the time and really appreciate uh, your uh, curiosity and your desire to learn what's the story behind the story. So thanks again, and we will be in touch uh, going forward.